I'm coming to get you. So, you're really, really an 80s fan. Okay, Mr. Belvedere, here's some more stuff for you. It's I Love the 80s Strikes Back, and this is 1985 again. The flicks, the fashions, the fads, the TV, the tunes. A totally awesome year that gave us even more burning questions. Did weird science promote self-abuse? Uh, how many times did you jerk off to that flick when you were a kid? I never talked off to anything! Did rich people really want to hang out with this guy? Come with us. Come inside. Robin Leach, interesting name. Living off the wealth of others. And was New Coke just a marketing screw-up or something much bigger? I'm not going to say where the conspiracy originated, but I will say this. The Pope was involved. The answers to those questions plus. Rocky goes from just punching people to killing them. And Bobby Knight goes ballistic. Because you can't get enough 80s. Because you still play with your gem dolls, admit it. This is 1985 Strike Back. Lifestyles of the rich and famous transports you to a beautiful, sexy world where dreams become reality and the sky is no limit. Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous is a show that details in excruciating detail all the things you will never have. We'll meet the most famous of people with their candid secrets and share the incredible luxury of the world's wealthiest. These people know what's good in life. They like spending thousands more than they have to for things they don't even use. Robin Leach, you know, just following around these people and their mansions and yachts and Rolls Royces. I love to see how, like, rich and famous people live. I'm a total sucker for that. I always wanted to be on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. We promise you the finest tastes of the sweet life. He makes poo-poo in a toilet valued in excess of $78 million. I mean, I, a show like that was like, made you really hate rich people. I almost didn't talk to my brother after that. It's a very, very good way to make you feel bad about yourself. Barna Trump told me it takes a staff of 21 four months just to wax the furniture in all 128 rooms. She pleasures herself with a vibrating dildo she bought in Spain in excess of 32,000 pesetas. Come inside. Robin Leach, interesting name. Living off the wealth of others. It appears down here they can't quite make up their mind. Cristal, Don Perignon, and Perio Jouet. Cheers. 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 Could nobody else do that better than Robin? Thank you for joining us. I'm Robin Leach with those champagne, champagne wishes, wishes and, and caviar, caviar dreams. dreams. We all look forward to being with you on the next Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Murdoch. I'm coming to get you. Yeah, man. That was my boy. Oh, yeah, Rambo. Rambo was the name. I loved Rambo. I loved him. I thought it was a great movie. He was a special op. He had been to Nam. He knew how to get those out. It was Rambo against the entire nation of Vietnam. And guess who won? You guessed right. You guessed right, sister. Rambo was an articulation of a much more aggressive, we're not going to take it anymore foreign policy. What better way to express that than having Sylvester Stallone grease himself up for two and a half hours? Clearly, I have more than a little bit of Rambo in me, as evidenced by these guns. When he's tying that 
bandana and you see his back and then you're just like, I want a back like that. Next day we're all like, does this get a back like that? Is this good for it? Dude, we got a tan. Once we get bodies like Rambo, then strippers are going to like us. It's going to be awesome. Rambo was Rambo and what you saw was what you got. Muscles and everything. I want what they want for our country to love us as much as we love it. This is clearly just an unabashed attempt at American jingoism, and it works. If Rambo were our foreign policy in the 80s, it would go like this. You're the other country, and then I'm just going to stab you into submission. What's more American than being sweaty, wearing a loincloth, and killing people? Really, that's, that's the American dream. And Stallone embodied that American dream. Mission accomplished. <laughs> This is crack. Smoking crack is like putting a gun in your mouth and pulling the trigger. In 1985, crack was introduced. I remember it was on the cover of Time. It was just like crack. Yeah. Crack cocaine hits America. Everybody's free base, and you're like, that stuff sounds f scary. Drug enforcement officials are calling it the frightening wave of the future. Crack cocaine in its purest form. The scary thing about crack, everybody who said, if you smoke crack, you're instantly addicted. That's not true. It took me four or five times. I, I live in a neighborhood that was just crack infested. I mean, five in the morning, my, I come home, it looked like a thriller video. Well, I'm like, damn, I gotta dance with these fools so they don't notice it's me. <laughs> crack is sold in rock form, usually priced at 10 to $50 a vial, which can be consumed in seconds. Inflation was a problem in the 80s, and cocaine was really out of the price range of almost all of us. Crack came along and was much more affordable. I actually, I think one of my first experiences of hearing about crack was just hearing people in New York say, crack is whack. Crack is whack! Crack was whack. It seems to me, if you were inclined to smoke crack to begin with, the rhyming phrase, crack is whack, is probably not going to stop you. The word on the street is, crack will blow your mind. Get her wife, you spin me around. <laughs> I really like that record. I really, I think the first time I heard it was either in a club or on the radio. Then I saw the video and it just freaked me out. Pete Burns, hottest guy I've ever seen. I thought it was a chick. All the guys were like, that chick's kind of hot in a weird way. I do it. Peter Burns was a perfect combination of Demi Moore and Boy George. You spin me right round, baby, right round like a record, baby. Like a record, baby. Okay, yeah, we know you're musicians, but can you come up with another analogy? What can somebody spin me round, round, round like? A merry-go-round? No. Like a blender, baby, right round, round, round. A record. Yes. Brilliant. That's a good song to sing when you're like seven years old and you've discovered the first legal high, which is this. You spin me right round, baby, right round, like a record, baby. Oh. You spin me right round, baby, right round, like a record, baby, right round, round. Coming up, Michael J. Fox's proudest moment. Like my experience of high school, the kid with the freaky facial hair is not usually loved by the rest of the school. Plus, everyone is speaking German. And the fun things you accomplish in rehab. You take a block from the bottom and you put it on top. You know you're getting better when you stop shaking enough to beat the junkies at Jenga. Next on I Love the 80s Strikes Back, 1985. And now, for Donald Logue's unfinished thoughts on crack cocaine. Dude, try doing this cleaning product. Whoa, good rush, all right. Whoa, 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 all right. I wanna do more of this, more, more, more. Leave my wife and family, leave my wife and family. Sell my car, sell my car, this makes sense. Yes, I'm thinking clearly for the first time in my life. Breakup songs of 1985. 
Because this boy too was love without a reason, I Boy George console you with the breakup songs of 1985. Take Broken Wings by Mr. Mister. I Miss You by Climax. And Don't You Forget About Me by Simple Minds. The breakup songs of 85. Aren't you prepared to let go now? Uh, I'd like a keg of beer, please. Listen, no ID, no damn beer. Can't you get that through your thick skull? Give me a keg of beer. I loved Michael J. Fox. And then, of course, when Teen Wolf came out, everybody had to go see it. Girls Across America were going, yeah! Teen Wolf is great. Um, the plot is a high school student played by Michael J. Fox, who, when he becomes very emotional, um, breaks out in lupine fever. <laughs> I thought the movie was fun, but I just couldn't understand why he was going to school if he was a wolf. If I turned to a wolf, that would be a day to take a sick day. <laughs> I just want to say, since when did Once being a wolf make you a good basketball player? <laughs> I mean, like, is that like back on the Nature Channel? <laughs> Here's Wolfie. <laughs> Slam dunk! Like, my experience of high school? The kid with the freaky facial hair is not usually loved by the rest of the school. But this kid's full on, you know, puberty to the 10th degree. And everyone's like, oh, Teen Wolf, cool, come to our party. I'll sleep with you, Teen Wolf. You just change back and forth whenever you feel like it. I don't know, sometimes I, I have to get kind of worked up to be the wolf. What do you think about to get worked up? One of the most memorable scenes is when he's on top of the van. He's flipping. He's doing all this stuff as the van is driving. I didn't try to handstand, but I have, you know, on several occasions, stood on the top of my tour bus as it's flying down the road. <laughs> yeah, that whole concept of that movie really bothered me because I'm a horror purist, and werewolves aren't friendly. Werewolves don't go to high school. Werewolves don't try and get the girl or play basketball. Werewolves kill you. They they tear you apart. And then if you uh, if you're lucky enough, maybe you just turn into one. You are an animal. Get out. Inspector Gadget. Inspector Gadget. Go, Gadget, go! Inspector Gadget was basically the Mr. Magoo of detectives. Know nothing, sees nothing, oblivious to the world. Let's take Maxwell Smart from Get Smart and make him a robot and keep the same voice, have him do some crazy things and whatever tool you need to stop a criminal and... That's Inspector Gadget. Inspector Gadget at your service. Inspector Gadget wore a big overcoat. You know, like a, like a rain, like almost like a flasher coat. You could flash your gadgets if you wear a trench coat. You wear your trench coat, oh, my gadgets. Woo-hoo. He has like 500 gadgets. He doesn't know what any of them do. My favorite was the little helicopter that used to shoot out of his head, like out of his hat, and he'd hold on to the little, the little handlebars there and he'd fly around. The roller skates came out of his shoes, uh, the nipple ring. I missed that episode. <laughs> Dr. Claw! You realize it was Get Smart again, because the Claw was a villain in Get Smart. I remember Dr. Claw. Dr. Claw will try to kidnap him. Your mission is to protect the professor from the forces of mad. Inspector Gadget was cool just because he was so dumb and go, the, Gadget, little, the little girl helps him with everything. You've got to rescue him, Brain. I'll look for the money. Penny. Yeah. Penny, his niece, she solves all of them with Brain the dog. Gadget, I don't know how you do it. You stopped the mad plot to dry up the earth. I did? I don't know why he was celebrated. He's an embarrassment to law enforcement for shame inspector gadget if i need a guy who's got a helicopter in his head i will call you until then adieu i 
Remington Steele. Yeah. Pierce Brosnan. He was really young. He had lots of, like, that hair that's, you know, stud, that English guy in the suit. I remember thinking that Pierce Brosnan was very cute, and he still is. I mean, the guy's name was Remington Steele. I mean, normally you see that in a Tracy Lords movie. You just don't expect me to call you your lordship. No, certainly not, no. We'll save the pet names for the bedroom, eh? Pierce Brosnan is certainly the better remembered of the two leads in Remington Steele, but might us not shortchange Daphne Zuniga. Uh, Stephanie Powers. Uh, no, no. <laughs> oh, that was um, Zimblist. Stephanie Zimblist. Whoever it was, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Let's not forget her. There would not have been Remington Steele were it not for Stephanie Zimblist. Tell me, Miss Holt, how did you become a dick? I beg your pardon. She had a detective agency. It was named Remington Steele, but there was no Remington Steele. And she hires Pierce Brosnan's character, and they would be private eyes together. Private eyes, you. Didn't he kind of goof it up all the time? And wasn't he the guy that, you know, was like, ooh, look at that girl, while the guy gets away? Then they also kind of had crushes on each other. So, like, every episode you thought and hoped they were going to kiss. I just, that's, that's why I tuned in. You always do things on such a grand scale, Mr. Pearson. Only when I'm aroused. Oh, yes, I know. I couldn't sleep nights worrying about that. Sexual tension between those people and Remington Steele. What would you say to a nice little American shag? Hello, nice little American shag. Remington Steele was primarily about sexism in the workplace. A female private investigator? <laughs> a private investigator must have one thing above all else, a penis. And Remington Steele taught us that lesson and taught us that lesson well. Ladies, lovely day, isn't it? Hey, you have video. Rock me, rock me, rock me, rock me, rock me, rock me. Falco. That was a jam. How did he come up with that song, you know, Rock Me, I'm a Danish? Well, what funny old thing to write about, you know? So I always thought it was Rock Me, I'm a Danish, Apple Danish. I'm a Danish, I'm a Danish. I'm a Danish, I'm a Danish. It made me think I could speak German. They sound like instructions from Nazis in Argentina. Ah, okay, plan B. The only way that I really knew that song was because I had seen the movie Amadeus. And I was like, oh, they're actually singing about Amadeus. It must, you know, be because that movie is so popular. Rock Me Amadeus is a good song to break dance to with a big grin on your face. It's just stupid. You take a block from the bottom and you put it on. That's where you pile the stuff up with sticks. No, was it with sticks? It's a game where you pull pieces of wood out and try not to topple the unit. Careful. People have strategies, you know what I mean? I think a lot of people too also got their like engineering and construction degrees playing this game. How you build a tower, you just don't stop. You stop and one knocks it over and that's when you stop. All over America, lame white people would go to parties and not know how to interact. Oh, it's nothing. <laughs> nothing. nothing. No. Then God gave us J Jenga. It's a Jenga. Jenga, what the hell is Jenga? Come on, Charlie, you got the fastest hands in the room. I have been through rehab. And Jenga is the game you play, and you know you're getting better when you stop shaking enough to beat the junkies at Jenga. Jenga, once you touch it, you can't keep your hands off it. Coming up, Judge Wapner lays down the law. Judge Wapner, he was the OG of the televised judicial system. Plus, He'll have no fury like a younger brother scorned. You stupid buttwad. Chet loved him. Didn't he turn into like Jabba the Hutt or something? And Jack A steals the show. Oh, Jack K. It wasn't even about the show. It was about Jack K. <laughs> Next on I Love the 80s Strikes Back, 1985. But first, log on to VH1.com for everything 80s. Artist info, photo galleries, CD purchases, and great 80s trivia games. I'm a 
1985. Yo, what's up, y'all? This is Doug E. Fresh, and y'all know what this one is. Have you ever seen a show with fellas on the mic with one minute rhymes that don't come out right? They never write, that's not polite. Am I lying? No, you're quite right. Yeah, we're about to hear. We swear. The best star rappers of the year. This is called the show. Me and my man Slick Rick and the Get Fresh crew made history with this. And this is a hip-hop classic. And it's love to y'all for appreciating this song. I'm a huge fan of the barter system, but to me, Tears for Fears is not a fair trade. Oh, I love Tears for Fears. There's just one song after another, and they were all good. They were like the pesh mode for straight people. They were kind of gay, but not so gay that we couldn't listen to them. They seem very awkward to be rock stars because they, they were like, they look like British public school boys, you know. I had the haircut, the Tears for Fears haircut. Definitely had that for at least a semester. They're both pretty ugly guys and not even sexy ugly. Like they got their ass kicked on the playground ugly. And with a name like Roland Orzabal, of course you got your ass kicked. Kurt Smith is at least kind of a, like a macho, like he could be a porn star, he could be an action hero. Kurt Smith. But Roland Orzabal? Let it all out These are the things I could do They were angry boys Come on I'm talking to you Come on <laughs> See, no wonder it was a hit Stain removal was huge in the 80s And Shout to me always sounded like a commercial For what I still believe is the greatest stain remover This country has ever produced you gotta respect Tears for Fears for the passion with which they sang about the little librarian. The library, remember her? Here were two sensitive guys, but they packed a punch with their music, and their lyrics. The lyrics are really good, and but it was really pretty and melodic. It had a nice combination, Tears for Fears. Indiana basketball coach Bobby Knight has invented a new sport, chair tossing. The rep did even better. He tossed Knight out of the game. Bobby Knight threw a chair onto the court and was thrown out in a game against Purdue. It happens to the best of us. Purdue just asks for it. That's excitement. That's real, that's real coaching. I don't think I'm really going out on a limb when you say Bobby Knight's a bit of a Not once was any mention of him being fired. No. They know it because they know Bobby Knight keeps the, the games exciting. That's why they only suspended him for one day. It was good for the school because everybody came to the games yesterday, not only to see him win, they want to see what Bobby's going to do. Yeah, I've had some Bobby Knight moments. Hell yeah. We've all been there. I was in a high school production of Bye Bye Birdie. The director made what I think was a really stupid directorial decision, and I threw my chair right at him. God damn it, that wasn't traveling! Coach Knight, it's okay. Is that okay? It's a basketball game! It's more important than life or death! I'm Bobby Knight! You missed it! That was a simple alley you I'm gonna kill you, you 19-year-old walk-on! I love these This is Miles Spires, the plaintiff. He alleges that he was hired by the defendant to trim her large tree, which he did. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, yo, yo, put your seatbelt down. This is LaRonda Schwartz, the defendant. She says the plaintiff was hired to trim her tree. What he did was to kill it. I think People's Court was the beginning of, um reality TV. How tall was this tree before he started trimming it? It was 15 feet tall. Okay. How tall was it after he finished? Seven foot stump. I never heard anything quite like this. This plaintiff 
dog bit the shoe of their next door neighbor. Let's have a half hour show about it. Coming up next. I was always amazed that it was such a little amount of money. What was it worth at the time of the lawsuit? It was worth $15 as is. The judgments were like for $42.17. It was the best because it had Judge Wapner. Judge Wapner. He was the OG of the televised judicial system. Even though he'd get upset, Wapner kind of always kept his cool. You may be tired or something, but don't do not do that now while I'm making my decision. You're being disrespectful. Judge Wapner had the gravitas of Chief Justice William Rehnquist, but he had the sex appeal of Brian Dennehy, and I think it was a winning combination. People often ask me, how do you keep a straight face sometimes? Sometimes you just can't. I'm a human being, too. And Rusty the Bailiff, man. Kind of the soft-spoken MVP of the whole show. Oh, no. Rusty. Oh, that's going to bring another lawsuit. Rusty the bailiff never had anything real to do except it announce when Judge Wapner was coming in, call court in session, and carry lame pieces of evidence from the defendant to the judge. Maybe you couldn't hear it. A lot of the people were saying, wow. And then they had the ultimate host, Doug Llewellyn. What a head of hair on that guy, huh? If someone owes you money and won't pay, don't take the law into your own hands. You take them to court. That's what Friends of Four was a really schmoxy, sassy song. Gladys Knight, Stevie Wonder, Elton John, and Dionne Warren were not really the epitome of cool. Dionne was just trying to bring crappy entertainers together for a good cause. It was a song um, to help um, AIDS awareness and AIDS charity. It's unfortunate when your prom song is associated primarily with AIDS. But maybe it's a good warning for kids. Wrap that rascal, guys. There's no place like home. There's your family around you, you're never alone. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love 227. It was hilarious. I'm a communications liaison. What is a communications liaison? A receptionist. <laughs> uh, 227 was about a group of people living in an apartment numbered 227. And stuff happens that's funny. It was like a Jefferson spinoff. It was like in between the Jeffersons and Bill Cosby. How much? I'm asking you to fix a refrigerator, not a 747. <laughs> Molly Gibbs played a sidekick on the Jeffersons back in the 70s. And here it is in the 80s, and now she has her own show. If you got a point, make it. Well, what are you trying to do there? You're Florence. But I guess it was Florence when she wasn't working for Mr. Jefferson. As long as you're doing a wash, sugar, why don't you throw your wig in? It's getting kind of dusty. <laughs> you know your problem, Mary. You just don't have enough coops. Oh, Jack K. It wasn't even about the show. It was about Jack K. The 227 is really the, the show that launched Jack K. Jack K stole the show from Marla Gibbs in a classic star is born moment. <laughs> That's my people. Did I shut you up? <laughs> it was like our little soft porn to watch Jack. Hey, 227's coming on. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any seats left. <laughs> Thank you, Lester. You kind of wondered why Marla Gibbs' husband never hit on her, but you no, know that's what he was thinking. He wanted to bang her. She must be some kind of woman. There's no place like her. I mean, no place, child. Coming up, Patrick Swayze spices up the Civil War. I know, I know slavery is bad, but Patrick Swayze's on the southern side, and he's just so cute. Plus, Coca-Cola gets a makeover. If you tamper with the formula of classic Coca-Cola, suddenly there are riots in the streets. And Foreigner brings out our soft side. Everybody will pretend it's a dumb song. The minute you hear it on the radio and you're by yourself, Next on I Love the 80s Strikes Back, 1985.
But first, this public service announcement. Rumor has it that you can get AIDS from a cat. Well, it's just not true. Domestic animals are not a source of infection from the AIDS virus. People cannot get AIDS from a cat. Nerds of 1985. What's happening, hot stuff? Getty Watanabe here, bringing you the nerds of 1985. Crispin Glover, the nerd who said, you're my density. Lucas Haas of Witness, horse and buggy nerd. And Larry King, the nerd who somehow keeps finding wives. Go Larry. The nerds of 1985, trust me, the donger knows. The Civil War, the defining epoch in American history, this was an important miniseries. It was a big, sweeping epic, you know, love story that spanned generations. It was a 38-part miniseries. Each part was nine hours long. Ah! Patrick Swayze represented the South, James Reed, the North. Yeah, they were best friends, I think, who fought on different sides. Patrick Swayze played a Southerner, so that was good, because you want to root for the South in the Civil War, don't you? I mean, I know, I know slavery's bad, but Patrick Swayze's on the Southern side, and he's just so cute. The disappointing thing about North and South was that Patrick Swayze didn't dance enough. Patrick Swayze dirty dancing in a Southern Belle costume. Yeah, that's going to get you viewers. Do you keep slaves? My family does, yes. Are you evil, Mr. May? Oh, no. Virginia. Not again. Kirstie Alley is an ardent abolitionist married to a black man. Kirstie Alley uh, had sex with her slave. I don't know if that really happened in the South, but Kirstie did it. Good for her. Kirstie Alley, what a role. I believe it's time the South learned to compromise also. All the historical figures of the time were represented. Lincoln, Jefferson Davis, General Robert E. Lee, the great Emperor Nero, Hitler, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Zeus, Neil Armstrong. Everybody made an appearance in North and South. Noah. I went to public school, so I enjoyed North and South because I kept thinking, well, I don't know who I want to win. I had a hard time choosing sides in that thing. I don't care who you are, you can't not love. I want to know what love is. That foreigner record was one of those records that you shouldn't really have liked because of the way they looked. Good record. Yeah, bad hair. Everybody will pretend it's a dumb song, but the minute you hear it on the radio and you're by yourself, I want you to show me I want you to show me Who doesn't want to know what love is? <laughs> I don't want to know what love is. And what better vehicle than foreigners to tell you what love is? Tell me, Lou. Tell me, Mick. That's what that song's for. Driving in your car, crying, after having just met someone that might be a good relationship. I want to know what love is. If that came on and I was spending time with a nice guy, I that would I might think he's gay. Most guys still get an erection when they hear that song, not because of the singer, but because of the dance they were at when they heard it. You know, the first time. I wanna know. <laughs> uh, wanna get some uh, juice? Yeah, that song still gives me a chubby. That was a, a show about uh, a family who had a butler for some reason. They weren't a rich family. I'm really not sure why they had a butler. There's house cleaning, laundry, and what about the children? Well, as far as I'm concerned, they can stay. <laughs> Damn, I don't know where I was at when that <laughs> came on. And I didn't even really track him too much. He wasn't really a favorite in the Harlem hood. I think that $10 may just come out of your allowance, young lady. But I need that money for birth control. <laughs> Kidding. What was Mr. Belvedere's first name? I don't know. Uh, I his forgot. His first name was Lynn Belvedere. <laughs> Lynn? That's a girl's 
girl's name? It was basically another show where the comedy was homophobia. It was just like Bob Euchre putting up with the gay butler. Look, sir, I admit that I did introduce Wesley to the ballet. Oh, Mr. Dalvadier, you've made me appreciate opera, but I still want to beat you up. <laughs> What was the rumor about Rob Stone being Marilyn Manson? That's so scary. Hey, I don't want Dad to know, or anybody else. I would like to settle something once and for all about Mr. Belvedere. Rob Stone, the actor who plays the oldest son on Mr. Belvedere, is not, I repeat, not Marilyn Manson. All right, Kevin, your secret is safe with me. Mr. Belvedere, he wasn't just a butler. He was teaching them lessons on life. Touching. They're damn lucky to have me. Back in the 80s, Coca-Cola had a ri original formula, and for some reason they said, you know what, we're going to new Coke. A new taste destined to refresh tomorrow's world. They not only changed their can, but I think they did something different with the recipe. Sort of flat, and it is sweet, sort of like you left it in the open can in the refrigerator a while. Some were outraged. Outraged that the old Coke would be, what, what's going to happen with my old Coca-Cola? We're not used to having people talk about Coke not tasting good. If you tamper with the formula of classic Coca-Cola, suddenly we've got problems. Suddenly there are riots in the streets. On Close Up this morning, a tale of two Cokes. Some call it the marketing goof of the century. Yeah, I thought it was a big scam. I thought it was a great publicity gimmick when they changed their formula and then, ha, oh, they got the world's attention. We're changing it back. What we didn't know was how many thousands of you would phone and write asking us to bring back the classic taste of original Coca-Cola. I've seen some internal memos from the Coca-Cola people. The conspiracy was far-reaching. I'm not going to say where the conspiracy originated, but I will say this. The Pope was involved. The Pope was more than a little bit involved, if you know what I'm saying. Awesome! Jam, yes, I love jam. I used to act out jam, like in the school playground with my friend, and we do. Jam, jam is truly outrageous, truly, truly, truly outrageous. Whoa, jam! jam. <laughs> outrageous! This is a whole feminist doll ideology. Businesswoman by day, jam rocker by night. She was running her business mm -hmm. and then she you know met this computer named synergy <laughs> that turned her into a rock star <laughs> so you know she could just you know flash her earring and everything and then she was you know fronting this crazy band and stuff shows over synergy it seems to me that jim uh, needed to make a decision one way or the other which career path she wanted to follow. She's obviously got a lot of talent, but she's also got a mind for business. Leela, more napkins. I bet you get some more cups. And that is what is so intriguing about Jem. Showtime synergy. She always wore pink, right? She always wore her like white tights, like fishnet tights and, and pink dress. She was very like record chick, like pre Christina Aguilar and Britney Spears record chick. <laughs> Jen looks pretty good, doesn't she? Yeah, she makes the air sizzle. She had a boyfriend named Rio. Who doesn't want a boyfriend named That's Rio? That's pretty hot. And he had purple hair. Yeah. I think there was a lot of identity changes in the 80s. Like that was a big thing. I'm changing so often, I'm afraid I'll wear you out. A lot of girls in 1985 were coming up against this. Which direction do I go? Jem, part of her loves going to work every day, knowing that she's going to make the corporate world a better place. And yet there's a part of Jem that really just wants to rock and roll. Ain't no one else is the same. Jem is my coming up, every teenage boy's wet dream comes true. If we're going to have any kind of fun together, you guys had better loosen up. You know, when you're 15, you're not knowing what to do with Kelly LeBron. Maybe if they were 22, they would have got a good third base makeout. Next on I Love the 80s Strikes Back, 1985. But first, the what the moment of 1985.
1985, the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus attracted big crowds with their mystical unicorns. The only problem was they were actually goats with their horns surgically fused into one big horn. Hey, circus people, what the f***? Not a bad idea. What? Making a girl. Actually making a girl. She's alive. I lived for Weird Science. I used to watch it every day after school. The whole concept I just loved and it was my favorite movie. Weird Science is uh, basically Porky's meets Frankenstein. We can ask it questions. We can we can put it in real life sexual situations and see how it reacts. You're like, we're sick to manage it. You'd love it. These two nerds that can't get laid. Yes. So they realize, hey, we can do something with our powers here on the computer. And they invented some kind of, you know, playmate. They created the ultimate woman. Yeah. So, what would you little maniacs like to do first? Every boy at that time was like totally in love with Kelly LeBrock. I mean, it was like, and I thought she was gorgeous, but boys just had a different kind of reaction to that movie. How many times did you jerk off to that flesh when you were a kid? You know, was I the only one? If we're going to have any kind of fun together, you guys would better loosen up. You know, when you're 15, you're not knowing what to do with Kelly LeBron. Maybe if they were 22, they would have got a good third base makeout. You ever wondered how sad it is that your son's only sexual outlet is tossing off to magazines in the bathroom? Oh, I never tossed off to anything. Anthony Michael Hall was kind of like the king back then. He found this really good geek niche market for himself that he did so well. That scene there where he gets, uh, was he drunk or was he high when he was in the bar? That was one of the greatest scenes ever. Bitch needs your nuts. Bitch needs my nuts, man. Stop playing with Chad. Jesus, man. In the family jewel. In the family jewel, man. Chad is my favorite character in that. Chad, you know, Bill Paxton's character is fantastic. You stood, butt wide. Chad. He was such a smart, so gross. Loved him. How about a nice, greasy pork sandwich served in a dirty ashtray? Did he turn into, like, Jabba the Hutt or something? They end up turning him into a huge pile of crap, so they get their revenge on that. She kind of, like, taught him kind of how to grow up, and, and they had to fight, fight these guys at the end of this big party. We're gentlemen, so we're going to give you a choice. Yeah, you can leave in peace. You can stay and die. And here's the rub in the film, and here's where it gets kind of Shakespearean and interesting, is that they don't have sex, but the process teaches them deep values about what's really important. That's the truth. I'm really just getting off seeing you two guys straightened out. Seven lucky assholes invited into my compound. Supermodel, and from now on you will address me as supermodel. I believe that song's about dancing. Safely. It's safe to dance. And I would get on stage like that was just that's when I felt alive. Show's over, Synergy. Oh!